Alice and I work here at Cambridge University Press Book Club. Most of the books we sell are aimed at grown-ups, but for the Cambridge Festival I wanted to give kids a chance to quiz some of the brilliant experts we work with. I asked kids to send in their questions and thank you if you were one of the ones who did. I got some brilliant responses. Then I put on my special interview jumper, jumped on Zoom and asked them on your behalf. I had loads of fun doing these Q&As, probably because of all the cool questions I got to ask. Here's a few little blips because we're all at the mercy of our internets. But I hope you enjoy them, learn something new, and feel inspired to carry on asking questions all your lives. I'm Mike Berners-Lee, I am the author of There Is No Planet B, and I'm a professor at Lancaster University. And I help businesses as well to um, respond to the climate emergency. Okay, thank you. Um, so if it's all right with you, I'll just crack on with the questions. Um, yeah. The first one, kind of a, a big one, um, but it is, um, has climate change always been around? Well, the climate has always been changing. Um, historically, for mainly natural reasons, um, a whole host of uh, natural effects from ice ages to volcanic eruptions to all kinds of things. But what's absolutely new about the situation we're in at the moment is that humans are causing climate change and the pressure that we're putting on the climate is far, far greater than any of the natural cycles that we've seen in the past. Okay. So um, the second question then is, what is the biggest cause of global warming? So the biggest cause of global warming is uh, carbon dioxide emissions from the burning of fossil fuels, that's coal, oil and gas. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any irreversible aspects of, the, of climate change or the climate emergency? Well, sadly, there are some irreversible effects. So, for example, we hear about the ice melting from, from the poles and the glaciers. And even if we take very strong action now uh, and over the next century, there's nothing we can do to stop a lot more of that ice from melting and the future is going to have far less ice than we've ever known for at least the next you know, very long period. The amount of ice that there is in the world at the moment in the Arctic and the Antarctic is more than you know, any of you or your children or your grandchildren will ever know again. And what will that mean? Well, that will mean rising sea levels and also a whole host of uh, other ecological consequences, some of which we understand, but many of which we actually don't know about. We don't, what, one of the things about the way that humans are changing the planet is that we understand some of the impacts that we have, but we don't understand all of them. And that's one of the things that makes it so dangerous. Is there any way that climate change is good for plants? <laughs> well, <laughs> as the climate changes across the world, and there are some parts of the world that in the short term at least become more favorable for uh, some plant life. Some parts of the world, for example, that don't have enough water will end up getting wetter, even though some parts of the world um, that are just wet enough at the moment will end up becoming too dry. Um, but the other thing is to say is that the amount of, that plants need carbon dioxide in order to aspire and uh, the amount of carbon, as the amount of carbon dioxide goes up, that's one thing that does enable plant growth. Okay. So the next question then is, if plastics are bad for the planet, then why can't production of single use things just be banned? Mm, that's a very good question. So the trouble with plastics is that they are so convenient and useful. Um, and so it's so tempting to use them. And they're a very good example of the trouble that we humans get into because we're, we're so technically brilliant that we are, we're so good at inventing things. And then we invent this wonderful stuff called plastic that is cheap and easy and waterproof and 
lightweight and durable and it turns out to be useful for all kinds of different things and enables us to do things more cheaply and so on and so we start using it in just about everything and every now and again we discard it uh, because it's so cheap and then the next thing you know we suddenly look around and notice that it's all over the place it's right through the ecosystem there are millions of tons of it in the deep ocean split up into little bits on the most remote beaches in the world in the stomachs of birds and and, and fish and so on and we realize that actually there's nothing we can do to get this plastic back out of the ecosystem again um, and so it's a great example of how uh, the things that we do have consequences that we don't always understand and that are sometimes very serious. Not that they can't be banned. We can wean ourselves off harmful plastics. We can develop plastics that, um, that are biodegradable. We can, uh, you know, there are all sorts of things that we can do, but it takes effort. So the next one then, is it better for the planet for people to be buried or cremated? What happens to your body after your death is probably one thing that you should treat yourself to whatever you feel best about. It's a pretty special occasion. Um, but uh, actually it, uh, it looks as though um, a field burial is probably higher carbon than being cremated if you take into account um, the travel that all the mourners uh, have to undertake in order to get to the location. So most people live quite close to a, a somewhere where they can be cremated. So all the journeys turn out to be smaller and that's the biggest part of the carbon footprint um, of your funeral. So that's, whereas most people would have to travel quite a long way to have a field burial. So uh, for that reason, actually cremation turns out to be most of the time, a bit lower carbon. Has the Earth got a life and is it supposed to die eventually? So the Earth formed many billions of years ago and in many billions of years time, the sun will actually start to die. And as it starts to die, one of the things that will happen is it will expand a lot and it will actually expand into the Earth and that will be the end of the Earth. But to give you an idea of how far into the future that will be, if you look at the evolutionary process that will have taken place in that time, the beings that are on this earth are likely to be as different from us as we are from bacteria. Uh, when we talk about saving the planet, we don't really mean saving the planet. We mean saving it for humans and saving humans living on the planet planet thank you very much will be just fine would a giant earth hour or something similar where everyone turns off electricity actually help well the nice thing about moments when we all do something together or try out something unusual like turning the lights off or or having a day a week when we don't eat meat or whatever it is that breaks a habit, is that we open up the possibilities in our lives and we prove to ourselves that it's possible to live differently. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that's happened in this lockdown. So it's been horrible for lots and lots of reasons, but if there's a good side to it, it has proved to us that it's possible to live in all sorts of different ways. Do you think that the school climate strikes helped the fight against the climate emergency? Yes, the school climate strikes undoubtedly had an enormous impact on the UK and around the world. And I've heard it from senior politicians and the chief executive of the Climate Change Committee that advises the government on what to do about climate change, that the school strikes were, in, were instrumental in creating the political space that made the government feel able to improve its carbon targets, um, which they did you know, quite a lot a couple of years ago. So absolutely, the school kids going on strike in a, in a very positive but insistent way makes a huge, huge difference. It's, it's been 
brilliant. I mean, people my age should be embarrassed that it's been left to people, you know, to school kids. There's no doubt that the school kids have a very important and powerful impact. When they're all back in school, they can all start striking properly again. I know, this, hasn't it confused everything? Yeah. You know, a year ago, it was really clear who needed to do what mm. to really push for the change. And now this blooming pandemic has confused it all. Yeah. Yeah. So the next one is, is artificial photosynthesis possible? Yes, it is. And this is a concept that took some getting used to for me, but the truth of it is that it's about 50 times more efficient or something like that to create carbohydrate or protein by generating electricity on land using solar panels and then using that electricity to, dra to drive a, an industrial process to create carbohydrates and protein than it is to put plants on that land uh, and grow it. So one of the things that I think is almost certain to be part of the future is that we're going to get used to the idea of a lot more of our food never having been part, never having been part, sorry, never having been part of a plant or an animal at all. Um, and, you know, that feels instinctively, that feels a little bit nasty to me at first. But if you think of the pay that what we get in return for that is that we can then use the land, not for putting, not for putting crops and animals on, but for all the biodiversity that we could ever dream of. So we'll sacrifice a little bit of land to put solar panels on to drive the, if the food process and but we can liberate so much land to just make give nature um, the best opportunity possible that would be amazing and my my daughter was asking you know is there is there things that human beings are just going to have to to deal with if we want to to you know to make this work and i guess that that's going to be it eating things that we're just that are just unfamiliar and seem wrong in a way yeah, but I think we'll look back and we'll go, God, did we really used to drink that stuff that came out of cows others? I mean, I think we'll, you know, I think we'll look back and think that was crumbs. That was like <laughs> <laughs> some of it. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, we do already do extraordinary things. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um okay. Uh the next one then is. What would happen to the earth if everyone was vegan? Well, if everyone was vegan, we would have to be quite careful about how we managed our nutritional intake so that we all stayed healthy. But we'd take a lot of pressure off the whole food and land system. It would be much easier to feed the whole global population properly and create space for biodiversity. So there's no doubt that um, it would be helpful from an environmental perspective and from the and from the perspective of uh, enabling everyone in the world to have a decent diet. Mm. As I was wondering about that, and I'm um, just an aside here, but like land use, presumably you use far more land keeping cattle, for example, than you, I mean, in that same mm -hmm. amount of land could grow soy and that would, you know. Yeah, to, to <laughs> give an example, to give an example of how much more efficiently we can feed ourselves using plant-based food than animal-based food, um, 100 grams of soya beans has got less carbohydrate, less protein, and less of most of the human essential nutrients than 100 grams of beef have got. But most of our soya bean gets fed to cows in order to produce beef. And when you feed soy, 100 grams of soybeans to cows it doesn't give the cow doesn't give you back 100 grams of beef it gives you about 10 grams of beef back. so there's a colossal loss of nutrition in that process and the cow also gives you that beef along with a huge helping of methane which it burps up which is a powerful um, greenhouse gas and there's deforestation associated with the land that was needed in order to grow the soybeans in the first place and there are other environmental problems as well, such as, for example, we currently feed about two thirds of the world's antibiotics to farm animals. 
So there's a whole host of reasons why less meat and dairy is a good idea. We don't all need to go vegan, but go, eating less meat and dairy for nearly all of us is a very good idea for the planet. Um, okay, so this one then is, has lockdown and people not going out had any impact on the environment? Well, we've probably bought ourselves about four extra weeks of time in the climate crisis by flying less and doing less of the activities that we love doing that have carbon footprints because of lockdown. So in itself, you know, four weeks is nothing, of course. Um, but what's interesting about lockdown is that we have an opportunity to rebuild our lives better when we come out of it. So as we come out of lockdown, it's really important that we don't ask how can we get life as we knew it before back again. It's we should ask how can we get back a really high quality more sustainable life and that's about green jobs and it's about cutting out needless carbon footprints and it's about doing the things that actually bring real quality to our lives not some of the mindless things that we always used to do that trash the planet without really making us happy like buying things that we didn't need or traveling on journeys that turned out to be needless or all sorts of things yeah and i mean it's been a really important sort of full stop has it in a way and just may forcing people to rethink things their whole approach to life yeah yes yeah. sorry i'm just chatting <laughs> yeah, no, our, our, our species badly needed to stop and think about where we were going because we've been heading at high speed in the wrong direction and i hope that lockdown has given us some opportunity to do that stopping and thinking but what Interesting about school kids is that they look at the situation we're in with fresh eyes and they can see the madness much more clearly than we can and that's, that's one of the reasons why this striking school kids is such an, a powerful thing in the world because people my age have lived with decade after decade of a real conflict with the science saying one thing and everything about our society and our economy telling us to live in a different way. And that we've just kind of found a way of glossing over that and putting up with the mismatch between those two messages. But school kids come at this with fresh eyes and very often can just see that, you know, the way we're living isn't right. And so they, they look at our society and they say, well, look, the emperor's not wearing any clothes, is he? And, you know, that's absolutely right. And we need that message so badly at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a couple left now. Um, first one then is, um, which countries are the best at tackling the climate emergency and why? Well, um, it depends how you look at it. So in some ways, the UK is doing quite a good job compared to a lot of countries, although not good enough. Um, and most countries aren't doing a very good job at all at the moment, but at least we've set carbon targets and we are cutting our carbon emissions, you know, to a degree. We've got carbon targets that aren't good enough, but they are better than nothing. And if we can just build on what we've got and encourage the world to um, raise its game as well, then, you know, it's a start point. Um, there are some other countries that have, in some other ways, got off, got some good principles. So, for example, there's a little country called Bhutan in the Himalayas that isn't so focused on GDP for its economy, but it has a happiness index so uh, that it traces, that it tracks. And so it's, it's fundamentally gearing its economy up to look after, um, to, to chase the things that matter in life about people and planet, rather than just this crazy money metric that doesn't really make anybody happy and tends to trash the planet when we, when we pursue it too hard. Um, Costa Rica does quite a good job of having a low environmental impact um, uh, for its level of uh, quality of life. Um, 
And of course, there are lots and lots of countries where most people's carbon footprint is much, much lower than it is in the UK. But the problem with that is that in lots of those countries, the quality of people's lives isn't always that great. So, for example, the average Malawian um, has about, let me just do the sums quickly. Uh, the average person in Malawi has about one sixtieth of the carbon footprint of the average person um, in the United Kingdom. So that's a huge improvement. But on the other hand, um, the quality of life in Malawi isn't always that great, especially if you get ill, for example, or if you want an education. Um, and then the last one I have here is the one that I had came in the most often, inevitably, is what is the simplest thing that I can do to help in the climate emergency? OK, well, I'm not going to give just one thing here because it's such a big and important question. So there's, there's two sides of it to look at. First of all, there's the kind of sustainable living. Um, how can I cut my carbon footprint? And I'll, I'll talk about that first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, most people in the UK, you can divide your carbon footprint into about four different chunks. And the first one is about the food we eat. And the simple messages in that is less meat and dairy, waste less food, and try and make sure that nothing's been on an air, no food has been on an aeroplane. Second up, we have uh, travel and transport. And that's about um, trying to drive less, encourage your family to drive less, try to encourage whoever's driving to drive carefully, possibly not too fast on the motorway, try and encourage smaller cars, use public transport where possible, all of that. If you're buying a new car, try to buy an electric one if you can afford to, so that's driving. Uh, and the second thing is flying, and there's no getting around it. Flying has a massive carbon footprint. It's not that we can never fly, but we need to fly for only very, very good reasons and think more carefully about it than we used to few years ago. There's, there's no getting around that. The third corner is about domestic energy use and that's um, at the simplest level that's about turning the lights off when you're not in the room, um, putting a jumper on if you're feeling a bit chilly but you're only wearing a t-shirt, sort of simple energy saving things. And then the fourth chunk of my pie is everything else, it's all the non-edible things that we buy. So every time you spend money get used to asking the question, whatever it is you're buying, ask yourself, do you need to buy it? And if you do need to buy it, are you buying it from a sustainable source that you feel good about the supply chain that lay behind it, how it was made, who manufactured it, who were the workers who worked on it, you know, were they treated properly? Just try and ask yourself everything you can about, try and imagine the life of the product that led to it being on the shelf and ask yourself if you want to support that supply chain that uh, that made it by buying that product. So that's cutting, that's about your carbon and not just an environmental social footprint as well, but that's, so that's about how you live. And then the even bigger area for everyone to think about, especially school kids, is how else can you push for change? Because we need global systemic change here. And we all need to be asking, what can I do to help create the conditions under which the world can achieve the big system change that we need in order to deal with the climate emergency. And you know, one of the biggest questions you might ask is, should I be protesting? Um, I'm not somebody who thinks, oh goody, won't it be fun to take to the streets? But we need to have the change. And if it's done in a positive, constructive way, which sends out a really great message about how this, this is about improving everybody's quality of life whilst looking after the planet. If it's done in that spirit, then I think it's a really important vehicle for change. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, that I'm, I'm just talking now, there's no doubt that the um, Extinction Rebellion certainly had a kind of impact, but not, I mean, it was also quite controversial, wasn't it? And I just wondered, you know, is that, I mean, oh, sorry, it's not really a question, it's just sort of a comment, but it's like some some people could be put off protesting from the way that that was received or, or carried out or certain things that they did. Mm. Well, Extinction Rebellion at their best were brilliant, I thought. You know, when they were on Waterloo Bridge with the music going and the free food being dished out and the 
bookshelf you could just pick up a book and borrow it from and the talks that were going on and it was just such a feel-good factor and the police couldn't believe it you know when they were being arrested and they're singing you know to the police we love you we're doing this for your children the police didn't know where to put themselves you could see you know it was just amazing you know and then but like all big movements especially as they weren't hierarchical they couldn't they couldn't insist that every single person in the movement was always helpful so there were one or two examples of people jumping onto tube trains and stuff like that and that was a shame and they really learned from it. Um, they, they got their fingers, you know, burned. But we shouldn't expect them. We shouldn't expect any movement to be full of perfect people. I mean, it's not as though the fossil fuel industry is full of only perfect people. So, you know. But I do, th I do think it's important how, how Extinction Rebellion plays its cards from now on needs to be uh, very clever. Yeah. Thank you and thank you for answering all the questions. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.